Good morning. Today is the start of a series based on the book of Philippians. I would encourage you to read all of it sometime in the next few days. It's only four chapters, but they are good ones. It's the book of joy, and in these days we all need joy for sure. Happy is one thing, but it comes and goes. Joy sticks around like we do. Thank you for being here. Listen now to this song that will introduce our call to worship. In the midst of joy and celebration, we lift our voices in praise to you, O Lord. In the midst of trials and sorrows, we lift our voices in prayer to you, O Lord. Throughout all our days, we call out to God. We rest confident in God's love for us as we sing. Our Old Testament this week is about manna from heaven. Let's sing about the bread of heaven. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Guide me. Thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but Thou art mighty. Hold me with Thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven. 
Let us pray. As we sing our praise to you, O Lord, we remember the multitude of blessings you've given us. We are mindful of the ways in which you have lifted us when we have fallen low. Be with us this day as we gather to hear your word for our lives. Fill us with joy as we worship you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites. They looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. And then you shall know that I am your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew about the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Hear now the gospel lesson from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is and go thy way. 
I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. We tend to judge like the workers in our gospel lesson, but God welcomes all, all the time, all the same. We all get the same love and forgiveness from God, and let's sing about that now in Come Sinners to the Gospel Feast. Good morning. What brings you joy? That's a big question. Not what makes you happy. That's easier to answer. And we've already established joy is not the same as happy. Happy is caused by circumstances and joy is inside. It's lasting. Happy can come and go like a joke or a funny movie. Joy stays. Happy happens when life is good and nothing bad happens. Joy can happen in Christ even with the bad. This week starts four weeks during which we will read a section each week of the letter from Paul to the Philippians. Paul had visited Philippi, a prosperous Roman colony in about 50 AD. He traveled there because he had a vision from God calling him to come to Macedonia. So he went to Philippi and Thessalonica on that same trip. This church he established, a church of mixed races, classes, and cultures. It was the first church in Europe. This early church was a big help to Paul in both prayer power and financial support. Philippians is the most joyous book in the Bible. That's a bit of a surprise. However, because Paul wrote this while he was chained to a Roman guard, probably in the year 61. Paul was suffering in several ways by the time he wrote this letter. The NIV student Bible says many scholars believe Paul wrote Philippians in Rome just about the same time that Nero began feeding Christians to ravenous lions and burning them as torches to eliminate his banquets. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the horror of living in the same city as Nero and feeling enough joy in the Lord to say say it, knowing you could be a lion food tomorrow or a human torch? 
So we have to ask, in such an environment, how could joy possibly thrive? Paul points to Jesus' death to show that God can take even the darkest moments in history and turn it into good. The cross and Jesus' triumph over death prove that nothing is powerful enough to stamp out the reason for joy in the Lord, as Paul says. So the key word in Philippians is the word joy, hence where I started this morning. Paul uses joy or rejoice 16 times in the 104 verses in the letter to Philippians. Paul has no real reason to feel joy. His circumstances surely don't allow him to live happy, but Paul speaks of joy, joy in, joy in spite, joy because, joy even though. Oh, that all of us could feel that way, and frankly, I suspect some people do. Today, our epistle reading was Philippians 1, 21 through 30. And if you take time to read all of chapter 1 later today, you will see a few other things that are important for understanding the joy Paul talks about. He writes, he is thankful for the believers in Philippi at verses 3 and 5. I thank my God every time I mention you in my prayers. I'm thankful for all of you every time I pray. And it's always a prayer full of joy. I'm glad because of the way you have been my partners in the ministry of the gospel from the time you first believed it until now. Paul's whole focus was to preach the gospel of Jesus. That should be our purpose as well. Remember how often I've said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. So when we pray for others, we are like Paul. When we are taking part in the ministry of the gospel, we are living the way Jesus asked us to live. That should make us joyful. Another pivotal verse from chapter 1 is verse 9. This is my prayer, that your love might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight. Some versions say discernment. Paul is praying that the Philippians will continue to love each other and that the knowledge and discernment that they gain as they follow Christ fully will give them more and more love for each other. That should remind you of Paul's words in Romans, love your neighbor as yourself. Remember, Paul is in jail, chained to a jailer. What an awful job for the jailer, as well as an awful circumstance for Paul. But in the next part of the letter, Paul says that the prison guards have been listening to him as he talks about Jesus, and that some of them have been converted. Imagine hearing Paul and Timothy, who's also with him, according to the start of the letter to the Philippians, singing and praying and praising God all the while they're chained up. It would make you either crazy or a listener. And some of the listeners have become speakers. Paul says some are braver now that they see Paul still proclaiming the gospel even in this situation. Some are bolder. And some of the listeners have become believers. And what does Paul say about this? He says, I am glad the word is being preached. Just a reminder, Paul and Silas were put in prison in Philippi when he first visited there in 50 AD. They cured a possessed servant from a possession that caused her to tell the future. She made a lot of money for her master, so they were angry when she no longer had the curse and he and he had Paul and Silas arrested. They were beaten and put in jail. That was the night that they were singing and praying and an earthquake happened and the chains fell off. The jailer assumed that the prisoners had escaped, but they had not. So they shouted to the jailer, don't kill yourself, we are all here. The jailer then asked, what must I do to be saved? And the answer was simple as it is for us today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And he was, and his family and Paul and Silas were let go. That's what happened in Philippi 11 years before this letter. And that all brings us to today's reading. Hear it as I read it, stopping from time to time to share a thought or two. Because the first chapter is all about Paul being joyful in the suffering. I am using the new revised standard version as I read. I would encourage you to follow along in the in your Bible as well, multiple words are good. And through it all, there's still words such as joy and glad and happy. Paul writes, for to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet I cannot say which I will choose. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that by my presence again with you, your boast might abound in Christ Jesus because of me. 
Paul says, if I die, I will be with Christ. If I stay, I continue to help you. It's a hard choice, he says. And in the writing of it, he is convinced it's better to stick around and keep encouraging the early Christians to progress in faith because there is joy in that faith. And if he stays alive, people who grow in faith can tell others how their faith has grown along with their belief in the gospel. Paul wanted to continue his ministry among the Philippians and the focus would be to advance their spiritual growth and deepen their joy in the Christian faith. That's good focus for us all. We believers should be not be static in our faith either. We need to grow in understanding of all kinds of spiritual truths. This will increase our joy as we enter more fully into the understanding of the privileges that a life in Christ has for us, no matter our circumstances in life. Remember, Paul is writing these words as he's chained to a jailer. Poor both of them. Here verses 25 and 26 again, this time from the New King James Version. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy and faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. This version has the line that believers will be able to rejoice for Paul despite his suffering. There will be joy in their own faith, but also rejoicing that Paul can continue his faith and will eventually be back to worship with them. Many of us find joy in the Christian faith and practices of others. We love to worship together. We love to hear hymns sung with gusto. We love to know that other believers are praying for the ones we love and are praying for. There is joy in praying together, especially when we are praying for someone who is struggling or as Paul is likely to say, suffering. There is joy for us when we can pray joy for the suffering, despite the suffering, joy in the suffering. Next verse is 27, 28. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in your faith, one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and in no way frightened by those opposing you. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation, and this is God's doing. I like those verses. Paul is saying, live your life in a manner worthy of your name as Christian. Live like Christ. Then it won't matter if Paul gets there or not. These people will still all be unified in the way they are living, trying to work together side by side to share the gospel in word and deed, not afraid of the opposition. And for sure, there was plenty of opposition. God is in this, Paul says. Your unity will prevail over the opposition, so stick to it. It wasn't just Romans against Paul in the gospel. We, have, we must never forget that the Pharisees, those law-abiding religious fanatics, were also against Jesus. They did not want the Christians to lead the way to right, forgiveness and righteousness. They still believed one only got there by doing religion the Pharisee way. They could not accept that Jesus was the Messiah, and that belief in him would be the way to heaven. Nope. They believed there were 613 laws. Follow them to get to heaven. It's not possible, and it's joy-killing, for sure. And now the last verses, 29 and 30. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. No one likes to suffer. But Paul was the suffering kind, and he encouraged the Philippians to understand that suffering is part of the equation. Surely it is part of life. Most of us can attest to that. We've all endured times of suffering. James reminded us that the testing of our faith produces patience. He went on to say that we must let patience have its perfect work, that we may become perfect and complete, lacking nothing. We become more whole when we weather the storms of life. We know what we are made of when times are hard. Peter wrote the very similar thing in his first letter. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Paul, James, and Peter all remind us of this. In this life we will have trouble. Jesus said that as well, but Jesus went on to say, but I have overcome the world. We too will overcome the world if we remain faithful in the hard times, seeking the joy of the Lord to be our strength. Joy of the Lord, joy in the Lord. 
That's the point for today. It's been the point for centuries. Cyprian, the Bishop of Carthage, wrote this in the third century as he was anticipating his death. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world, but I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are the Christians, and I am one of them. And so are you. You are one of them. Rejoice. Find joy in life, even in the suffering. Let us pray. Father in heaven and Jesus our Savior, Father, you sent Jesus so we would know how to live. Jesus, you showed us the way to the Father, and life wasn't easy for you. You suffered for us. We can never fully understand that, but knowing you gives us joy. We rejoice in you and your love. Help us to never lose that, even when suffering comes our way. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, your blessings of bound in our lives and we lift our voices in gratitude for these lovely gifts from you. We're joyful in the many ways you've blessed us. It's without merit that we have so many joys in our lives, but we lift our grateful hearts now and thank you with joyful voices. We also lift our voices as our hearts cry out our concerns for those who are ill, who mourn, who feel lost. We offer to you our concerns. Lord, hear our prayers for these named ones and for those unknown to us still suffering. So often, Lord, our joys and concerns are intermingled in our lives. We pray for families who are grieving, even as we know their loved one is safe in your arms. We pray for people who are struggling with illness all the while. We're thankful for the care of medical folks and loved ones. We are thankful and joyful for the life of Jesus. We also know he was born to die for us. Let us never forget that and forgive us when we wallow in sorrow and struggle and when then fail to live into the joy you promise. Lord, you have heard our cries and our shouts of joy. Make your presence known to us again through the love and forgiveness of others as we have loved and forgiven them. Those very words are part of the prayer you, Jesus, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is Sing a New Song to the Lord. And now this benediction, 
Go forth into God's world as God's own children. Let the love of Christ be reflected in your life and your deeds. Be like the early church in Philippi. Preach the good news of Christ crucified for each of us. Go with joy as a blessed child of God. Amid the struggles of life, live joyfully. Amen. Dismiss us with thy blessing, fill our hearts with joy and peace. Let us each thy love possessing, triumph in redeeming grace. Oh, refresh us. With